Hello and welcome to the GMS Magazine channel. I am Paco Garcia, your host, and this is the Board Game Interview Room, the show in which I am lucky enough to get together with some of the best people in the world of board games and ask them tons of questions about projects, both past, present and future. Today I have with me Lee Broderick, who is the signer of this little game, Dwarf, that I was very, very keen on when I unboxed and reviewed it a little while ago, that was published through one of my favorite publishers, Dragon Dawn Productions. Now, I'm not going to talk about Dwarf with Lee too much, because he has another game in the making called May Show, which I have to admit, I didn't know it was a real place. It is a real play, so I learned something very interesting. Uh, May Show once again takes us underground but I'm not going to tell you a lot more about it because Lee waxes lyrical about it with very good reasons. Uh, it's um, actually, it really made me want to take a look at the, at the game, which I am very upset about because I know that they sent me a preview copy so I could make a review and a playthrough. And thanks to mail delays related to COVID-19, it has not arrived as of today and I am talking on the 22nd of January, so this is very annoying because I really wanted to take a look at it, but um, I guess it's going to have to wait. Anyhow, before going on to the interview, if you're listening to the podcast, please leave us a review. Whatever you're listening in iTunes, Spotify or whatever, please, please, please leave a review on scoring because that helps with the visibility an awful lot. If you can subscribe to our Patreon for just a couple of dollars a month, that makes a difference and it will help us keep this going and get more games, more equipment, go to more shows and do more stuff that we would, we would love to do for you, please. But I'm not going to rumble any longer. Here is Lee. Uh, Lee, welcome to the show after... Um, 10 minutes of trying to get my equipment ready. Uh, I, I think this is uh, 2020, trying to just slap myself uh, in, in the face for the last time, hopefully. How are you, my friend? I'm good. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> Let, been... Let's hope we've left most of 2020 behind us now. <laughs> there is a lot to leave behind, I can tell you. it's um, Yeah, it's, it's been quite an interesting, never-to-be-repeated-again experience, I think. Let's hope so. Indeed. Anyway, um, welcome to the show. This is the first time you're here, even though uh, we have been uh, sending each other emails for I don't know how many A weeks while. now, yeah, yes. <laughs> which is quite um, quite something. But we've done it. We're here. And people may not know this, but uh, we're here because you have designed a game that's going to be released through one of my favorite companies, uh, Dragon Dawn Productions, uh, Maze How. And... And I know nothing about it. Okay. Only That's a good I, start. I, yeah, well, they, it makes it easier for me because that means I can ask you no further question because I have no idea. And I'm guessing, <laughs> hoping that people, you know, watching this are going to have no idea either. So it would be very informative. Um, mm. I only know that I like the cover a lot. It's, I love it. It's a great cover, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It really yeah. works very well. Um, we'll we'll go a little bit into what the, um, the art of the game is going to be mm -hmm. all about and everything. But before doing that... Um, just to familiarize ourselves, um, who are you? I mean, what, why who are you publishing I? a game? It's, it's a good, yeah, that's a very good question. Why am I publishing a game? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm a middle-aged British person who's currently very upset with our government. He would <laughs> but, be uncouth not to, really. <laughs> yeah, but perhaps we shouldn't go into that too much. Not in this podcast. Another podcast, yes! <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so I've spent, uh, I've had a few different careers over over my lifetime. The last 10 to 15 years, I've been working as a, as an archaeologist, um, which feeds into the design and the theme of Maze How, as we'll get to in a minute, I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, uh, that was, so Maze How was actually the first game I released as a, as a print and play game um, nearly five years ago now. Um it's been redesigned quite a bit for Dragon Dawn Productions. Since then, Dragon Dawn Productions has uh, has published another one of my games, Dwarf, which came out um, a year ago. It shipped. 
and he's actually very good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So are you, um, I mean, are you designing these uh, games uh, because you want to publish game for fun and decided, yeah, why not? Let's do it for a little bit of glory as well. I mean, or is it just that you're very passionate about it? What's, what's your background within gaming? For fun, fun is the right word. I mean, as I say, Maze How originally was a print and play game. Dwarf originally was a print and play game as well. Mm-hmm. And that's very much my ethos that I created something because I wanted to create it, because I wanted people to enjoy it. So putting it out there as a print and play game, um, and Dwarf as well was developed substantially from its early beginnings. But just having something there was enough for me. If people wanted to download it and play it and enjoy it, then that was, you know, I'd given something to some people in the world to enjoy, and that was a good thing. Having the games published means that they get development and they get polished and they get better mm-hmm. and it also means that more people get to enjoy those games because you know plenty of people aren't actually that interested in crafting a print and play game but a lot of the time i'm not i'm, I'm guilty of that so, as well. yeah it's, <laughs> it's it's not about the glory for me it, you know i don't expect to, to get rich from my games it's so it's certainly not about the money it's purely about um creating something that people can enjoy and seeing as many people as possible in experience that and enjoy it and have fun that sounds sounds really good to me how did you um how did your relationship with dragon dawn started uh to and got to publish dwarf mm. so I, I first um i first got in touch with uh timo at dragon dawn productions when the what was it the petitions mouth traitor guard expansion was on kickstarter I think would have been about the summer of 2017, maybe about four years ago now, four and a half years ago. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And at the time they, he was asking for some play testers for the new scenarios for that. I I loved um, Petitions Mount the Bissell Rift. It was very good. Um, I just, just finished doing my PhD at the time. So I had a bit more spare time on my hands. So I said, you know, this is something that I, that I can do. Um, So I got in touch to do that. I did some play testing. Um, Within about two months, suddenly I found that I'd ended up somehow writing all of the Kickstarter updates as that campaign <laughs> finished up. <laughs> um, and slowly I started doing more and more with the company. I designed some scenarios for the revised edition of Petition's Mouth. Um, and, you yeah, know, I got to know Timo better. I've helped out various conventions. Um, he picked up on the on the print and play games that I've done and offered to, to publish them through Kickstarter. So that's uh, that's where we're at now. And I think that's uh, probably the first time that you and I had some sort of contact because uh, I believe mm. that you, uh, you are the one who uh, curated and refined the, the scenario that I wrote for Petitions Map. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I was quite heavily involved with that at the time, trying to yeah, get get all the playtester feedback on the various new scenarios that were being done. Um, edit some of the the English. Um, I think not you so much, Paco, but I really? think maybe Marco. One of his <laughs> scenarios, and he needed a lot of rewriting, especially on the story side. <laughs> well, then I, I remember. I remember my scenario uh, took a lot of refining because it it was a weird thing in that it was mm. an awful lot of sprouting monsters yeah. coming all the time, and the rules didn't really. Uh, cater for that easily enough so it was it was quite uh intensive uh heavy, heavily labor i intensive. think that was a fun fun part of the process though the fact that you know there's several of us that all came together with different ideas and just trying to look to see what we could get out of the existing system and really push it to its limits hmm. okay so um we jumped from there to to hmm to Dwarf and the production process of, of Dwarf, uh, because it's a game that I have enjoyed a lot uh, because it, it packs a lot of meat in a very small box. Mm-hmm. And I have to say that I really enjoy the solo mode of, of right, the game. Um, because, mm-hmm. I mean, right now, every game should come up with a solo <laughs> mode. Um, but I, I, I do enjoy, you know, the, the diversity and the variety of the game mm-hmm. when, when it plays solo. It's is very replayable. How did you achieve that? So if I cast my mind back to how I sort of first had the idea for that game, um, it would have been uh, one of the print and play, um, the solo print and play contests on Board Game Geek. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I'd done Maze Howl the year before, 
Um, and I, I actually had another game already that I'd started design on. And I was going to put into that competition. Um, and I, and I did put into that competition, but the night that the entries opened, um, I'd been playing Caverna. Right. And Caverna is a, a game that I really enjoy. Um, but it's always frustrated me that I'm meant to be a dwarf and what I'm doing is farming. That just doesn't make sense <laughs> to me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Fair enough. So the next day when I got up, like that thought was sort of still in my head. And I thought, oh, well, you know, may maybe next year um, that's what I should do. I should create a, a worker placement game where you're actually being a dwarf as opposed to you're just being told you're a dwarf. Um, and, uh, you know, I've already got my game for this year, so I'll do it next year. Um, and I went to work that day. And as I was driving home from work, the ideas for this game just started materializing in my head. And although I loved Caverna as a solo experience, I know a lot of people don't. And mm -hmm. um, I know the reasons for that I often cited that it's uh, it's a solvable puzzle with a fixed um, setup. Um, that there's no variety and that it's a beat your own score game. Right. So as I started to think about it, I thought, well, okay, so if I can do a worker placement game, it's about being a dwarf. Maybe I could, even though I enjoy the game, maybe I could try and fix some of these issues that other people have as well. So you would be playing against an opponent. Mm -hmm. The variability would change. Um, and then that sort of, the two sort of fed into each other and it became this quite early on in development, it became this card system that exists there now of flipping cards over so that the, the worker locations changed in every single turn of the game. So you never knew what was going to be happening. And that led into, um, you could use those cards to drive the AI as well. And it became in the end something that obviously, as you all know, is very, very different to Caverna. Whereas Caverna is that big strategic experience and you can sit down at the start of the game and plan out, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what my strategy is going to be. Mm -hmm. Dwarf is a far more tactical game. Yeah. And that was something that I hadn't really come across. I think it started, I've started to see a few other since, but at the time I hadn't come across that in Euro games. Worker placement games typically are very strategic titles. Dwarf takes that core mechanism, but it becomes a very tactical game where every single turn you're having to react to the state of the board and make the most of those opportunities. So it, it, it it very quickly is, as I can, as, as I say, as you all know, and um, as 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 you'll know from both games, it very quickly became a very different game to to its uh, to its inspiration. Um, yeah. Okay. No, no, I, I, I like I, I like what you're saying that, and it, it allows me to search way very nicely into Maze How because mm. you're going back into the dwarf realm. What's with you and what dwarfs? <laughs> um, I'd, you're underground um, there's, there's a saying I, I'm from Cornwall originally and there's a saying in Cornwall that any any hole in the world if you look down at you'll find a cornishman at the bottom of it okay. <laughs> we used to be very well known for our mining okay um, um, but no there's there's no uh, there's no dwarfs in Mace House so Mace How, um I'm going to assume, Paco, and forgive me if I'm wrong, I'm going to assume you don't know anything about Maze Howe, not just the game, but anything about the place Maze Howe. No, um, because I, I I mean, I haven't, I know that Timo either has sent or is going to send a prototype for me to take a look at and record a couple of videos. But as, as of today, and this is the 4th of January, 2021, I have not received anything. Okay. So I, I haven't been able to look at it. Okay. So I'm a bit so, blah, I don't, um, but I haven't. So no, I don't know the place either. Right. So Maze Howe is a Neolithic chambered tomb uh, mm -hmm. that's in the Orkneys, which are the, an archipelago just off the north coast of Scotland. Okay. Um, so it's about 5,000 years old as a structure. It's, it's, it's really, really old, really impressive tomb. And years and years ago, I read some of the, the Viking sagas. Do you know them? Uh, some of them I haven't really. Yeah, but you're aware. Them. You're aware of what they are, yes. and yeah. So one of the Viking sagas is um, set around Orkney, um, mm -hmm. and it's one of it's one of the the later sagas that tells the tales of the the Isles of Orkney during the 11th and 12th centuries. And I read them, and like with a lot of the sagas, there are bits where you think, okay, this bit's probably true, and this bit is plainly made up, and this is definitely 
lottery. Mm -hmm. And there is a bit in one of those sagas where one of the Jarls um, went into the tomb of Maze Howe and discovered this enormous amount of treasure, which he then buried and nobody's ever found. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the truth bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and then there's another bit, um, just three years later, a, di a different Jarl, um, he's going a, a, from one part of Orkney to another at Christmas and a blizzard and a snowstorm gets up sort of out of nowhere and they can't really see anything and they're desperately seeking shelter and mm -hmm. they see what a, what they think is a house, the, mm -hmm. a round house, and they go round it and they can't find a door. So they climb on top to go through the roof and fall into the tomb of Maze Howe. They've obviously fallen through the hole that this other Jarl made a couple of years earlier when he was looking for treasure. So they then had to dig themselves out alive because they've fallen 20 feet to the floor. Okay. So, I mean, and that was just an amazing story. That actually sounds a lot more credible and a lot more interesting. Right. But then in 2016, um, as I say, I am an archaeologist and there was an archaeology conference on the Orkneys. So I went up to this conference and because I was going up there and I'd always wanted to go there, I spent an extra week there on holiday. And I went into Mays Howe. And what I found out that I didn't know before was that inside the tomb is the largest collection of Viking runic graffiti outside of Scandinavia. Oh. And it's absolutely amazing. And one of these pieces of graffiti actually says... I was with Jarl Rongval when we found the treasure. It's buried northeast of here. And there's this contemporary Viking graffiti there that more or less is saying that these fantastic stories were actually real. And okay. it just blew my mind. And I, I went away from that thinking, God, you know, more people should know about these stories because it's an incredible story. Um, and at the time I was writing some, some short fiction and I thought well, maybe I could write a sort of a modern retelling of these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I was driving back in my car um, after the holiday, I was driving back down through Britain and the, these thoughts were still sort of mulling over in my head. And I thought, you know what? It would make a fantastic solo game. What, what a theme that you're not breaking into the tomb looking for treasure. You actually, you're in the tomb and you've got to try and get out. And mm. nobody's done that before. And the fact that it's based on a real story as well, you know, that's incredible. So that was how I first came to the idea to try and do it. This is it's, it's a historic game that isn't based on um, you know a natural disaster or a war or mass suffering, which I think is unusual for an historic game anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's a very personal game. It's a survival game. Um, as I say, you, you, you're going into a tomb, but you're not coming away for for glory or trying to find treasure. Um, one of the cards in the game it is a treasure card. But the way that I've approached that is that, so I, the, the game recasts these two separate events as one event. You're the two Jarls, mm -hmm. you've gone into the tomb together and you're trying to make it out alive. So when you find a treasure card in the game, that's a bad card because what, what would make you stop trying to cooperate? Well, if one of you could get rich and even richer if the other one gets out, then you might not want to cooperate quite so much, yeah? Mm. So that adds to the tension. <laughs> yes. So how does the game play in that case? Because it, as you say, it's a very unusual theme, mm. uh, but I get the feeling that theme has actually been very important for you to keep throughout the game. How yeah. does it play? So it's a, it's a very simple game. Um, it's the same sort of size and length as Dwarf. So it's a, you know, a, a, a quick game, but I hope with more decision space than a lot of games that we normally call filler games that are that sort of length. Mm -hmm. um, and it, but it's a very simple game as well, that you have a, a hand of five cards and on a board in front of you, you have some health tokens, a health tracker, um, a food tracker. So those are your resources you're trying to manage through the game. And you've got a series of passage tokens that represent the passage you're trying to clear to dig your way out. So the aim of the game is to remove those passage tokens. Okay. And the, dif the difficulty changes basically by how many of those passage tokens you include at the start of the game. Mm -hmm. And on your turn from your hand of five cards, you're going to play one card to a row in front of you and you're going to discard a card. Okay. You can do that in any order. It's up to you. 
But discarding a card often has an effect as well as playing a card. Mm -hmm. And it might well be a negative one. So if I discard this, I'm going to lose a, a help point of health. But if I play it, then something else bad is going to happen. So you're constantly being faced with these difficult choices all through the game. And what you're trying to do is to play four Excavate Passage cards in a row. That makes one set, and you can remove one Passage token. Okay. Okay. So you're trying to, to cycle through the deck to get rid of these cards. On the tougher difficulty levels, you're going to have to cycle through the deck more than once. Mm -hmm. um, because once the draw deck runs out, the game's over, regardless of whether you've cleared the passage or not. That's one of the ways you can lose. Either you mm -hmm. run out of health or the draw deck runs out. The only way to draw up the, the draw deck again is an effect in the game called going mad. Okay. which sounds terrible. And let's face it, none of us want to go mad. What happens is um, each, there's two different suits in the game. And if ever the five cards in your hand have, this, have, have the same matching suit, then that triggers the go mad effect, which means you discard your hand, you put your hand with the discard pile and you shuffle it back into the draw pile. So all those bad cards that you've been through once, you have to uh, face again. Mm. You also permanently lose one of your health tokens when you go mad. Okay. <laughs> so it's got it even tougher at that point. But on the higher difficulty levels, like I say, you're going to have to go through the deck more than once. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you can dis draw your discard pile back into your draw pile. So trying to engineer when that happens and choosing when that happens becomes a crucial part of the game and the strategy involved in it. So uh, trying to uh, the familiarity with the cards, <clears throat> pardon, uh, it's it's going to have an impact on how mm. you play the game because I can imagine the first few games when you don't really know what you're going to expect, uh, you're just going to find out and yeah. react to whatever. But once you know the decks, then that's going to be easier for you to try and preempt what's, what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Um and as I say, at that point, then you can start to increase the difficulty by you can move these extra, ex, the excavate passage tokens, more excavate passage, more passage tokens in to excavate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and there's also included in the box several little mini expansions, okay. which, uh, which consist of um, three extra cards, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a small deck and you are going to go through it. And those mm -hmm. three extra cards are going to have a big impact on the game. So each of those can be mixed in with the main deck. They come with their own um, setup variations as well, maybe with some extra health or extra food or extra passage tokens to try and get past. Mm -hmm. So that adds to the, the puzzle and the replayability as well, that you've got these extra expansions to mix into the game. And it, it's really, it's a hand management and resource management game. That's, yeah, it's very pure in that regard. I like the sound of that quite quite a lot because it, it sounds also like a game that it could be very easily expanded with more expansions or mini expansions, expansions right. if need be. Um, how many of them do you have, you know, flying around in your head? Because I, I get the feeling that there's something you think about a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's three in the box at the moment the box that's been sent to you. And those three are guaranteed to be in the box day one at the start of the Kickstarter campaign as well. So if it funds, they'll be there. Okay. Um, there are there are ideas for more as well. And we just have to see how funding goes. Well, let's, let's hope very far indeed. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about the artwork that you have chosen for the game. What is it going to look like? So we're working with the uh, with two artists actually, Matthias Catrian, who did um, I think is mainly known for Dominion, mm -hmm. um, and also with Lars Monk, who did the artwork for Dwarf previously. Um, and I, I absolutely loved what Lars did with Dwarf. Um, I think he did a fantastic job. I agree. Um, so he was somebody we spoke to very early on um, with Mace Howe as well. He did the the cover design. Mm -hmm. Um, which he did a lot of research for. That structure you see there is actually what Maze Howe looks like in real life. Oh, okay. That's, so, that's very good because it could it would have been very easy to just, you know, invent something since, uh, you know, yeah. I reckon 99% of people will not have heard of, of Maze Howe, the real place. So. No, that's right. So it was important to try and get that sort of accuracy in there. Um, 
but he very we, we spoke early on about what the game was and I, I made clear to Lars I said you know this, this is a much more adult game than mm-hmm. Dwarf was um, it's much darker it's much grimmer it's much grittier um, and he understood that straight away and he, he read the rules and he looked at the game and he came back to me and said I, I think I understand what you're going for this is a very existential game mm. and I said yes that's the word that's good yeah so he got it straight away um, he wasn't because of other commitments he wasn't able to do all of the art um, so Matthias did some as well but I, I, I don't think you'll notice a huge disjoint between the two artists in the games um, you, I don't I think I uh, if I hadn't have told you that, maybe you wouldn't have even known there were two artists. Okay. <laughs> I think I think there's a good, yeah, you know, they fit in well together. You're not going to look at one card and another card and go, these don't belong in the same game. Okay, that, that that's good because uh, from from the art direction point of view, I have to say it's quite jarring to see yeah. when, when you see two completely different stars and you think, oh my god. No, I I agree. I think that it? was that was something I was really worried about when it became apparent that Lars wasn't going to be able to do all the art. But I think we've we've done well in the end, and both artists have done well, and the, the graphic design elements help tie it all together as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's a dark, gritty game, and uh, you know that obviously the art had to reflect the theme of it's not a happy place. <laughs> Where's the tomb? <laughs> yeah, you're, 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 you're literally trapped in a tomb <laughs> yes. and outside is a raising blizzard that you were trying to escape from. And now in order to escape from that, you've got to dig yourself out or you're never going to see daylight again. And the funny thing is that if you don't dig yourself out, you're going to die. If you dig yourself out, you may still die too anyway. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> a lesson of the two evils. Oh, how terrible. Um, okay. <laughs> What's going to be in the box? What's going to be in the box? So there's um, a player board. Um, there's uh, some tokens, um, cardboard tokens. Um which represent the, the passage sections, as we talked about. Um, mm-hmm. Also food tokens, health tokens for two players, because it's okay. a one to two player game. Um, and uh, what we call a YAL token, which is a bit like a first player marker, but it has a very important role in the two player game, uh, which we can talk about in a moment, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the deck of cards, um, mm-hmm. including the expansions. So it's, it's not a great deal. It's going to be the same size box as Dwarf. Okay, so, so it's going to be a small, small little thing that people can take yeah, pretty much everywhere. Exactly, um, which is it's uh, it's an unusual size box. I think you'll agree. Um, but the reason that Dragon Dawn Productions has designed that size box and is producing games in that size um, is basically for postage reasons. It's a very practical thing that it can fit through a letterbox. And from Germany, it gets sent as a large letter, so it saves on postage as well. Mm. Yeah, and the thing is, to be honest, the, the, it doesn't need any more box than that. I know that no. a lot of the games come in bigger boxes because they have more shelf space and yeah, space exactly. to see. But uh, and and you're right, Dragon Dawn's been doing this. You know, they they really did it with their winning. Uh, mm. So it's it's, it's, it's right. the same size. Yeah, box, that was the first one with that, and then um, I think one of the one of the Perdition's Mouth expansions was in the same size box as well. I think correct. Yeah, but that was the reason for it. It was a distribution issue. The fact that from the distribution center in Germany, it can be sent out to everybody as a as a letter and save save money for all the Kickstarter backers, basically. Mm. No, that's, that's that's excellent, absolutely excellent. Um, mm. are there, is there going to be any uh, possibility of having expansions to uh, three or more players for the game? Um, I don't think we can have more more than two players. Um, it was originally a solo game and when I came up with the idea for the two-player game as a co-op experience, I think it works very well. So the way that that works is you've got the same food resource. Okay. Um, you've got the same deck of cards that you're both drawing from, the same discard pile. Um, but you each have your own set of health tokens. Mm-hmm. Um, you each have your own hand of cards. And in addition, there's this Yarl token, which as I say is a bit like the first player marker. Okay. And on your turn, exactly as in the normal game, you have to play in excuse me, you have to play and discard a card. But alternatively, if you're in possession of the Yarl token, you can choose to basically skip your go and pass that token to your your companion. Mm -hmm. So that opens up a new strategy for you, basically. If you're trying to get these four Excavate Passage cards in a row and you're sat there saying, well, look, I can't do this, but you can, Mm -hmm. then you can pass that token over. But then next time round, you aren't in possession of that token, so you can't just keep passing, skipping a turn. 
you can only skip one at a time and you can only skip if you're in possession of that token because you passed it to the other player then. Right. So it's it's a really simple idea that I'm quite proud of, I think. Yeah. It's, 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 it really forces cooperation in a way that I haven't seen in any other games at that point. That, that sounds very, very interesting because um, it would be very easy to turn the game into a competitive game in which only mm. one player can come out of the, yeah. of the tomb by, by themselves. Yeah, so, you could make it like a race game or you know, do lots of take that in there. Or, correct. But, but it really changes the feel of the game at that point. Have you, have you actually tried and considered releasing a player versus player edition of, of, of the rules? I, I think we tried... I think we tried some player versus player very early on, um, but it lends itself more to this co-op experience. Okay. Um, and there is a second co-op variant in the game as well, mm-hmm. um, which instead of using that token that I just described, um, you're, you're, it's, it's called the, the Fear of the Dark variant, okay. which the developer came up with. Um, And he found with some of his playtesters, they were enjoying playing this way instead, which was there's no communication. So instead of having the R token, you can pass a card instead to your to you to the other player instead of discarding it. So you can play a card and pass a card to the other player. They then have to discard back down to five cards. But that's a way of sharing information without talking. And they, they really enjoyed that. So there's two different ways of, um, of playing the game as a two-player co-op. No, that sounds okay, which also fits with you because there are two ways of playing Dwarf Solo. So that, yeah. that, that actually works out very well <laughs> indeed. Um, let's assume that, you know, the crowdfunding has already taken place mm-hmm. and, and it's, it's gone swimmingly, which is the idea. Uh, how long until the game is fully produced? When are people going to be able to buy this game off the shelf? It'll be this year. Um, we're aiming, we've had the quotes in for production and... I think it's more than likely now that we're going to have a, a European um, manufacturer. Okay. Um, which obviously means that we're not subject to the usual problems with you know Chinese New Year and Somalian pirates and all the other things that yeah. makes Kickstarters go on longer than they need to, um, production go on longer than they need to, I should say. Um, so, you know, we, we've always been fairly... Um, cautious in our delivery estimates mm-hmm. um and we've i mean dwarf i think is an example of one that we managed to manage to ship out to at least european backers ahead of schedule um so I, i'm confident that dwarf is going to be um available this year um certainly by Essen if Essen happens oh <laughs> I, I would be very surprised if it did and to be perfectly honest even if it did i don't think i would be going this year anyway just in case it's yeah it's a difficult decision for everyone to make i know that essen 2019 was the last convention i went to i think and i was due to go to aircon here in the uk um the weekend before the first lockdown here started and i just said no it's not worth the risk no. um but no so we'll definitely be available by then i know um timo has actually penciled me in for a different convention earlier in the year as a, a launch for the for Dwarf. Um, so we're fairly confident about getting it out in a, in a matter of months. Good. Um, do you know what will be the retail price of, of the game? Yeah, um, we're putting a, a retail price of $25 um, dollars, euros on it um, and the Kickstarter will be 19 That is very, very reasonable. I think so. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. And, and and to wrap it up, um, what's uh, what's next for you? What are you, th- what are you planning? Because I, I can imagine that you're not going to be still for a while. Yeah, I've got a, a few different ideas that I'm playing around with at the moment. Um, mostly bigger bigger games than what I've produced so far with mm-hmm. Dragon Dawn. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, one of them is, um, one of them I'm quite excited about that I've now asked, uh, asked the developer from Maze How to join me as a co-designer on it. So nice. I'm, I'm excited to work with him on the, the design of that going forwards. Um, so yeah, we've, we've got lots of lots of ideas cooking away and uh, hopefully we'll get another one to a, a finished state over the course of this year, ready for Kickstarter the following year. That would be absolutely fantastic. I really, really, really look forward to that. That would be really great. And I look forward to playing Maze How. I mean, I'm, 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 
I'm quite gagging to get to get. I really hope it gets to you soon, Paco. I know. I know they've the the prototypes we sent out to Canada have arrived. The ones we sent out to Australia have arrived. I don't know what the delay is with Spain. I have no idea, but uh, to give you an idea, my sister-in-law sent us uh, the Christmas gifts on Mm -hmm. the first of December. We've got them today. So, I wonder if um, I wonder if they've been held up at the border here with uh, all the COVID restrictions. It could be. I know that there were about three or five thousand lorries uh, trapped. Yeah, in Cali, I know. Like just before, um, I think again, perfect timing. The day that those restrictions were announced, I arranged uh, a trade through Board Game Geek with somebody in Poland, and the couriers that I normally used just wouldn't accept any parcel so i ended up using somebody else who was more expensive he uh, i received the game from him um last week but he emailed me earlier to say he hadn't received his and i checked the tracking information and it's still at the border here yeah I, i'm not surprised at all yeah. but but yet i was sent a, a role-playing game for review on the 17th of december and i got it by the 23rd oh. so well, fingers crossed you get it soon anyway. I hope so too, because I, I really am looking forward to it. So uh, I will be letting you know as soon as, as soon as I possibly can. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I really hope this whole endeavor is a fantastic success. Uh, Thank you. And, I, and I, I look forward to seeing what else uh, you can in mind and hopefully having you back to talk about it. Thank you very much, Paco. It's been lovely talking to you. I look forward to seeing what you make of myself. Huh? I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to love it. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Whenever and wherever you are listening to this, whether it is in 2021 or 2077, I don't know, I really hope that May Show will be something that will tickle your fancy and you will feel inclined to take a look at it because I reckon it is going to be very well worth it. Uh, I'm not kidding. I am I am genuinely upset that as of today I haven't received the copy because I, I wanted, I so wanted to look at it. And after the interview, I wanted to look at it even more. So I hope that you will tell me if you get it, how good it is. Please leave some comments down there in the video description, in the video spaces, and send us your comments through our Facebook page and get in touch in Twitter. If you would love to be, would like to be here, please let me know because I would definitely love to have you around. So if you are a designer, an illustrator, or a publisher, and you have a project that you would like to see featured in this channel on the podcast, please get in touch. Because, you know, this is what I do this show for, for you. So let me know. But until the next time, thank you, genuinely, thank you for being there. And I will talk to you very, very soon. Take care.